The U.S. government is about to change table saws forever. Some for the good, some for the not so good. Let me explain. Before we get started, I'm not an attorney and I'm not giving legal advice. I'm just translating what I've read. This is my opinion and my thoughts on this subject. But I will link to all the documents and everything you see in this video in the description below so you can go check it out for yourself. Have you ever heard of the Consumer Product Safety Commission? Well, they set rules and regulations on the safety of products that are sold to consumers, us, and that includes table saws. In October of 2023, the commission came together and decided that, well, it's time to fix these table saws. And they're actively working on a rule that will require a table saw not to cut you more than 3.5 millimeters into your skin. In other words, a, a fairly minor injury. In this video, I'm going to share with you some major arguments that are coming from both sides, the table saw manufacturers and the government. I have actual letters from CPSC to the major manufacturers and their responses, as well as a video of their commission meeting, uh, some high points that they're discussing there. Ultimately, what it boils down to is money, because if they institute this rule, which I think they will in this year, 2024, then the cost of a table saw will go up significantly. In other words, a bench top style table saw like this, that's usually about $299, you're gonna have to add about $200 from what I can gather on the estimates to the price of this saw. Cabinet saws may go up even more, up to $1,000 per saw. Hmm, that hurts. So why is the government doing this? Well, this isn't the first time this has been proposed. Way back in 2003, this was proposed to the commission by Dr. Stephen Gass, who invented the saw stop, trying to get regulations in place to make table, table saws safer and it just didn't, didn't go anywhere, it just stalled. And it, they have brought this up a couple of times since, but it's always stalled. But I think this is the year we're gonna see it unstall. So why is this happening now? Well, over the years, they have implemented some actual safety measures that are, have to be on these saws, or mandated, like the riving knife, the blade guard, those sort of things. But even with those regulations, you're still having 30,000 on average table saw accidents every single year. And these injuries come with a significant cost, all the way from if you're just going to the doctor or clinic to maybe get a little Band-Aid or something, all the way up through hospital visits or stays, which can cost with pain and suffering and by their estimates, up to a half million dollars. So if you amputate a finger and have to go or a hand or have to go in the hospital for surgery, stay there for a day or so. So the total cost of that, including the pain and suffering is massive like a lot of money here. You can see here on this chart that I found on their website showing the cost estimates of these each type of injuries. The major issue here is the fact that Consumer Product Safety Commission wants the AIM technology or active injury mitigation technology put into every saw. The struggle is how do you make manufacturers put it on there when the technology is actually patented? Well, according to them, you're gonna to have to either license it, come up with your own technology or basically kick rocks and get out of business because if you don't have it on there, if the rule goes through, then you can't sell table saws in the United States. So basically right now, as far as we know, as far as I know, there's three companies that have safety technology that stops or prevents the blade from hitting your hand. Number one, we all know SawStop has that technology available. Number two, Bosch. We know the Bosch Reacts was here, then it wasn't. I don't know the details of that litigation. And then number three, Felder Group also has a technology or Altendorf, if you saw that video I made with them, have very similar technology that it detects the hand before it gets to the blade and just drops the blade down. So those three technologies are available. So to try to figure out what it's going to cost to get the AIM technology on every saw, Commissioner Feldman and Trumka sent letters to the big players in the space, Stanley Black & Decker, which owns DeWalt, SawStop, TTS, which owns Festool and Saw Stop now, Hitachi, Bosch, all of them got letters basically asking what patents they currently own and how much this is gonna cost in essence. And the replies they got back in the letters were quite interesting if you ask me. The letters that they sent to these companies asked five main questions. Number one, they wanted the list of patents they currently own. And number two, the patents they do own, they wanted a list of litigation that they've been involved in since 2000. Number three, they wanted a complete licensing history of that patent technology. Number four, they wanted to know if they had that patented technology, would they make it freely available for manufacturers to be selling saws in the US or could they license that technology to those companies? 
And number five, if you remember, Bosch had the React Saw. Saw Stop sued them for patent infringement, which stopped them from selling it inside the United States. Number five, they wanted to know what that agreement was. I can tell you it's confidential and they didn't release any of it. So Saw Stop's response was, we own 151 patents. About half of those are, I'm paraphrasing, about half of those are expired and several more will expire in the next couple of years. Basically, they, they talk about some licensing deals they have that's not really relevant here. The big question is, would SawStop give it freely available or license it? They said that they would, quote, SawStop Holding LLC is evaluating whether to commit either to making that patent freely available to competitors for use in the United States or to license that patent on FRAN terms if the commission enacts a rule, the safety standard presented in the current SNPR. From what I gather from that, it's kind of a non-answer. It's like, yeah, we will evaluate and see if we want to do one of those two things. Okay. Now the Felder Group, which has this really cool technology that spots the hand similar to Altendorf, they had a kind of an interesting response to the questions from the commission. I'll quote from the letter and you can read it here. Felder Group machines with AIM technology, machines with PCS are designed for professional users. What I'm reading into that is not hobbyist and or small businesses. The technology used is very complex and cost intensive. At the moment, the additional cost to the consumer is more than $8,000 for their technology. Although we are looking on the reduction of those costs, we do foresee that the cost cannot be reduced to below 1,000 at any time in the future. It's interesting. So that one's probably not gonna be licensed by your contractor style saws. I think it's hard for the companies to answer the commission based on generalities. They need something specific that gives, lets them answer specifically. Let me tell you, the response from the CEO of TTS, he says, in general, TTS is open to the possibility of a license should the CPSC promulgate a rule requiring all table saws to incorporate active injury mitigation technology. And this is where I think uh, they need direction because he says, given the breadth of the intellectual property, patents, copyrights, trade secrets, and know-how, that has been developed by SawStop since the petition was filed back in 2003, only a portion of which is related to AIM technology is no longer a simple matter to say what such a license would or should include and what the structure should be. And he goes on to say in the next paragraph, to be perfectly candid, given the history or lack of progress from the petition over the last 16 years, the likelihood of CPSC moving forward with a creation of a rule requiring all table saws to include AIM technology seems remote at best. He doesn't have a lot of faith in the commission. I do think they're gonna do something. Bosch did respond to the commissioners as well in a letter, a very long letter. Actually, you can read through it. I'll link it in the description. Basically saying everything that they wanted to know was confidential based on the litigation that happened with SawStop. It's kind of a mess there, so move on. First, I still have many unanswered questions about the intellectual property necessary to comply with the proposed rule. This is one of the key issues uh, in, in, in what we're trying to do here. Staff states clearly in the briefing package that the proposed rule would most likely require all suppliers to use patented technology uh, in their table saws. But the package also notes that as of 2016, SawStop had more than 100 table saw patents and that Dr. Gass had filed 140 patent, patent applications that may still be relevant. We don't know what patents Dr. Gass, TTS, or SawStop have secured in the interim since 2016, but we do know that SawStop is actively pursuing a litigation strategy to extend the length of the relevant patents where it can, including at least one recent appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't share staff's comfort, therefore. Now, that's interesting. So SawStop is obviously trying to get their patents extended so that they can protect that IP longer than the 20 years-ish that you're supposed to have that patent. That's what I'm gathering from this statement from Commissioner Feldman. Uh, they've got an appeal into the Supreme Court now, according to him, uh, trying to get those things extended. So how are they gonna, uh, they're wanting to play that licensing game out, I don't know. It seems like they're just, uh, you tell me what you think. But it's a mistake for the CPSC to depart so radically from the pro-consumer, pro-competition safeguards that OIRA endorsed. And this information, is, frankly, is critical to our decision-making. Approving the proposal without such basic information is premature and misguided. I'm concerned that the commission runs a very real risk of creating monopoly in the table saw market. So the commission is actually worried about creating a monopoly on the, in the table saw market if one manufacturer has the technology available to stop these blades from damaging your hand and they license those out. Because if, for instance, if SawStop is the one that everybody licenses from, 
because it's the most affordable, because it's a rule now, if they, if they approve this, that you have to have it on there. And if they want to continue to sell table saws, they have to license it from somebody. You're going to go to the lowest bidder, <laughs> most people. And Feldman is way outside everybody else's, especially contractor, cabinet style saws price range. SawStop's going to be it. And so they're going to have to license it from SawStop unless Bosch can get their stuff in there. Oh, it's a mess. Second issue I want to raise, raise and it's related uh, to the IP licensing terms, they would have a substantial effect on, on table saw costs between the IP licensing, redesign, and other related costs, staff forecasts that the per unit increases could exceed $1,000 per saw, saw, maybe 20% or 30% higher than even that. I suspect that's why the chief counsel for the advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration offered comments suggesting that, that uh, suggesting changes to the 2017 NPR, which we didn't adopt in the current SNPR. $1,000 per saw increase possible, like I spoke before, Typically, that's going to be on your cabinet style saws. The contractor saws, everything that I've seen, and especially in some of the comments and responses that I read, was it's going to be about 200 ish dollars on a, con a bench top style saw like this. So, this is now a $500 saw instead of a $300 saw. Contractor saws, similar to like the Delta that I used to have, that's going to be increased even more, three to $400 price range. So, you're seeing a significant price increase. If they institute this rule, they're gonna to have to go in and not only, not only do they have to license the tech and pay for it, most likely, they're also gonna to have to retool their manufacturing. They're also gonna to have to come up with new parts and pieces that's gonna to have to go into the saws so that it all works like it's supposed to, plus research and development, plus all that other stuff. So yeah, you're gonna see a major price increase across the board on table saws. NPR, which we didn't adopt in the current and SNPR. If we finalize this rule, the cost of table saws will increase. This will directly affect consumers, including small contracting businesses that, 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 that rely heavily on these products. I'm also concerned that the benefit side of the cost benefit calculation here is deficient. And now that I work at CPSC, I see that my concerns are backed up by the numbers. Table saws send almost 50,000 people a year to the ER. And there are gruesome injuries. These are gruesome injuries like fractures, and finger amputations. The Civil War was responsible for 60,000 amputations. Table saws are responsible for 65,000 amputations just since we were petitioned to fix the issue. Since 2003, 65,000 amputations from table saws. That's why the CPSC is looking at this so hard and hasn't let it go. It's just kind of been dragging on. But I think the reason is because it's going to create such a price increase and not only that, a hardship on the manufacturers to implement it because once they say, okay, the rule is it has to have AIM technology on there, you have starting date this. They also proposing in this proposal or in this rule that they cannot stockpile stock. They can't make a bunch of these older table saws and stockpile them up so that they can say, well, we're just selling our old stock. So they're really going to limit them on, okay, when the rule is in place, you have to have AIM technology by this date, and you can't stockpile older saws, so you have to have them on the shelf. You can see where this is, is going, where you're getting pushback from the manufacturers going, whoa, I don't want that much price increase, because what's going to happen is a lot of the lower end model saws or smaller companies that don't have a very big market share on their table saws, in other words, they're not selling enough of these to eat that cost and make a profit, they'll just quit making table saws altogether. I don't have any examples for you as far as what company that might be. I wouldn't think it would be DeWalt or Milwaukee or some of the bigger brands, but some of the smaller brands will probably just let go of the table saw altogether and you won't be able to buy it from them. So that's where I disagree here a little bit because he said it wouldn't be that hard for them to come up with technology to basically stop the blade. Probably true, but what happened to Bosch when they come up with something? They got sued and made to stop selling those saws in the U.S. Same thing would happen if DeWalt come up with a similar uh, system or Stanley Black & Decker. They would literally get sued for having that type technology, which is why you see companies like Felder Group and Altendorf come up with a different system. In other words, you don't have to make contact with the blade. Cameras are watching your hands and it's picking, looking for uh, the actual shape of the hand and it's gonna pull the blade under the saw instead of a break hitting the saw. It's a different technology 
Uh, but yeah, I think it's a little harder than just saying, yeah, we're going to come up with something because they know litigation's coming and there's so many patents to kind of go around. It's a huge mess. Why isn't this safety technology ubiquitous? The, ans the answer might be as simple as money. It seems that saw sellers appear to be scared that if they start selling saws that are safer, they might open themselves up to liabil uh, product liability lawsuits when injuries occur in greater numbers on their other saws. So we're in danger. So what he's saying is pretty much the same argument as if you watched my previous video on the saw stop patents, is if you put the technology on your top end saws, you gotta put it all the way across the board, which is why they want to come up with this rule that mandates all table saws, no matter if it's a bench top style, all the way up to a professional grade table saw have the, tech, the AIM technology available on the saw. The one place where I draw issue with this proposal, just one, is that it wants to wait three more years before this rule goes into effect. That would mean condemning 150,000 more people, innocent people, to serious and gruesome injury, people we should instead be protecting. In the final rule, which I hope to receive later this fiscal year, we'll have to select an effective date that's reasonably necessary to address the hazard. With a rule that has billions of dollars in annual net benefits, a logical question to ask might be, isn't there a reasonable need to start gaining those benefits now? To start gaining those benefits as soon as possible, maybe even 30 days after the rule goes into effect, because that's the shortest period we're allowed to do that by law. And on the other end of the spectrum, the longest period we're allowed to do by law is six months. To depart beyond that requires good cause. Here, staff seeks to depart all the way up to three years, and I don't currently see any good cause to do so. Based on what Commissioner Trump could just said, that's why I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. You're not gonna see this in 2026 or 2027. I think this is going to happen in 2024 or early 2025. All table saws sold from that point on will have to have the AIM technology. Now, the cost of meeting these new rule requirements, should it go into effect, is what's really going to hurt saw manufacturers, in my opinion. Number one, it's the cost of the AIM technology. They've either got to develop it themselves or they're going to have to license it from another company, which is probably the most likely scenario. They also have redesign and retooling costs for the saws they currently make. So take this DeWalt table saw, for instance. If they have to put AIM technology on here, they're going to have to retool and make new parts and pieces to make that work on this saw. The innards of the saw have to be changed. All the molds and everything that they currently have will no longer work for the bottom parts and the motor and all that stuff. They're going to have to change all that. Not only that, material and labor costs will change because if you're adding stuff to this, you're gonna have more material and you're gonna have more labor costs to test all that stuff, make sure everything's working properly, all the inspection, all that stuff's gotta go through too. And what I find interesting in this part of the document also is it says the structure of some bench saws, in other words, bench top style, may need to be strengthened to improve stability and withstand the shock of the blade breaking or reaction. This strengthening may increase overall weight of the lightest saws, reducing their portability and utility. This is a light saw, y'all. It's, it's fairly light. So they're saying that they, some saws may have to be restructured so that they can handle that jarring stoppage of the blade and not damage the actual structure. Now with all these changes, you can expect, or they expect, and I expect, reduction in sales of table saws altogether because you're going to price some people out of the market altogether. If the minimum cost of entry is $500 for a table saw or for even $400 for a table saw, for a beginner or an intermediate woodworker on a budget, that's a massive hurdle to overcome. Massive, that's a lot of money for somebody to try to get into woodworking. So what you're going to see is people just won't buy them. They'll figure out other workarounds, literally buy a track saw for $250 and, and use that for your straight long cuts or just a long or a straight edge and a circuit saw. But you're gonna see that sales gonna dip and they expect that too, as in this chart on table nine of the document, you can see they expected sales reduction, 97,000 reduction in sales of the bench top style. 9,000 of the contractor and cabinet saws are at 3,800. This is estimated on the low end. On the high end, that's even higher than that. So they really do expect this to make a significant impact on the sales numbers of table saws. Now on the topic of making a monopoly out of the patent holders, in the availability of the AIM technology, part E of this document is in the response to 
the commenters basically saying they'll either have to get out of the table saw market or they'll have to license this tech. There are three in the U.S. market currently. Saw Stop, owned by TTS, which equips its table saw models with the AIM technology. Bosch, which isn't selling anything in the U.S., and then the Felder Group. And also Altendorf, which is a German company. They are selling their big saws, but they don't make anything like this. One thing to point out though is that the rule doesn't specifically say they have to use a certain technology. The only thing the rule mandates from what I've read is it can't cut more than 3.5 millimeters into your skin. So they can use any technology that's available and or come up with their own. <laughs> but it's hard, it's easier said than done, right? And the last part of that E where we're talking about giving monopoly to the company is this. It says, while we are mindful that the current suppliers of AIM technology might be able to exert significant power in the U.S. table saw market for a period of time if the proposed rule is adopted. The unusually extended effect date proposed in this SNPR 36 month from the provocation of final rule, together with the encouragement of innovation and aim that the rule should produce sufficiently address the concern, we seek comment on this analysis. So what they're saying is, yeah, it's probably gonna give a benefit to whoever owns the license, but from what I'm reading, it probably won't be that long. <laughs> It's still giving them a benefit. Now this will have a, uh, an impact on small businesses. They even point this out in the document. Number two, impacts on small business. It says most small manufacturers are expected to license and aim technology instead of developing their own technology because the cost of the developing is gonna be quite significant. In paragraph two, if a small table saw manufacturer is able to license technology, it would have to determine whether each table saw model would remain profitable after redesigning it with the AIM technology. Further, small table saw manufacturers that are able to license the AIM technology from TTS or another table saw manufacturer would pay royalties to a competitor. This could reduce their competitiveness in the table saw market. See how that works? If they got the table saw technology, the AIM technology, and then you have to license it from them and you're competing it from them, man, it just doesn't seem right. And here's the proof that they may drop some table saws from the line, certain companies will. Right here in the last part of number two, it says, given that small table saw manufacturers have expressed that they may drop one or more table saw models and leave the market entirely if the proposed rule is adopted, the proposed rule could have a significant impact on small manufacturers. It's not just a light thing here, y'all. It could really take away some table saws that are available today. Now, how much would this impact the cost of table saws? Well, there is a table, labeled table eight, it says direct manufacturing replacement costs. On the low end, they give low end and high end estimates. On the low end, a bench top style like this one, $193. On the high end, $651. Adding $650 to this table saw that's already $300 puts it at almost $1,000. Now, contractor stalls, similar to the uh, rigid or delta style saws that stand up on their own, you're looking at low end $321, high end $1,000. I find it also interesting that the cabinet maker or the cabinet saws are also low end, high end, same price range. And then, of course, the replacement part costs is what they're talking about, like the blade break, all that. That's what they're looking at there. Uh, on the low end, total direct with replacement costs, you're looking at low end $300 high end 769 so the low end just took this saw from 300 to 600 on the high end it took it over a thousand dollars including replacement costs yeah. there was also a comment and then a response from the commission on the cost increase that's going to happen it's going to make them unaffordable for many individuals and small businesses to be able to purchase a table saw and the response was as discussed in section x of this preamble uh, they estimate the price for the least expensive saws now currently will be more than double to 400 or more dollars. So they know that they're going to cause a at least doubling of the lowest end saws. Where's a $200 table saw to make it 400? I, I don't know. I've not seen a two unless it's like a Ryobi or a, or a, a Hercules model. I don't think Hercules costs it. a Bauer model maybe that's $200. You don't see many of those out there. But it goes on to say that in general, the retail prices of bench saws, bench top style like this one, could increase as much as $285 to $700 a unit. Contractors, $450 to $1,000. It doesn't really go into the cabinet style saws. But it's absolutely going to cost, as proven in this video, it's going to cause a significant increase in all table saws, even the ones that we all really start out with. So with all that going on, is it worth 
literally mandating that all table saws have this technology available. I am a huge fan of saw stop table saws. I have the PCS. I've also reviewed the, the little bench top style one. I think they're amazing technology to be able to stop those blades from injuring your hands. I personally think it's worth the extra cost, but at one point, didn't matter how much I thought it was worth the extra cost, I couldn't afford to buy it, and I couldn't afford to pay the extra cost to get it, no matter how much I wanted it. It just wasn't gonna happen, it wasn't in my budget. So I think that when you start putting these saws or mandating things to be put on saws like that, that will increase the cost of the saw significantly, it's going to have a major impact on our hobby and or small businesses. It's no way around it. What do you think? Also, should the government have their hand in this? Basically mandating something that they have to put AIM technology on there, and if you don't have the resources to develop it yourself and then fight it in court, when you get sued, you have to license it from somebody else. That's where I think we're getting a little sticky here. I don't know that we should mandate you have to license this technology if it's available from another company, especially without setting forth rules of that company on how much they can charge or <laughs> kind of limiting things because if you don't put limits on them, what are they going to do? If, if I own this table saw and I have a technology available that I can license to you, supply and demand says I'm going to be able to charge you more because I'm the one that owns the property and you don't. But you want it and you need it to sell your saws, so you got to pay what I want. It's just kind of supply and demand. And so that's what's going to happen with this uh, moving forward. I think we're going to see this happen, and I think you're going to see the price of your table saw start to increase. Now, with that said, there's nothing they can do about the models that are currently for sale or the current that you currently own. They're not gonna mandate you go back and put AIM technology on any of those if you already own them or if, you, if they're already on the market. But they are preventing them stockpiling, so what's on the market and available is all that's gonna be available. I wanted to hear from a real patent attorney on this subject, so here's Mr. Michael Steele, a real life patent attorney. Tell us about what's going on here. Welcome, Michael Steele. He's a patent attorney from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, so I, I am a patent attorney and I specialize in, uh, you know, drafting and prosecuting patent applications. I did want to preface that anything that I'm about to tell you should not be considered legal advice. It's just legal education. Uh, and I don't represent anyone uh, that I'm aware of on this call. Uh, I also want to emphasize that this, what I'm going to talk about today, is a little outside of my normal expertise. So this is definitely not something that you should, uh, you know, go to the bank on for any anything I'm about to say. Uh, this is this is just uh, uh, my thoughts on what possibly politicians are going to do, and who knows, you know, if they would follow anything I would say anyway. Awesome, man. Thank you. So first question: Do you think this rule will be implemented this year or soon? So I definitely don't think the rule will be implemented this, this, this year. So I actually looked at the Federal Register, which is the uh, opinion uh, that was issued by the uh, U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. And uh, a couple of interesting things with this. Number one, this commission is already authorized to make the change without an act of Congress. So I do think that will help things that, you know, I always joke that Congress can't agree on what to order on a pizza. Exactly. Uh, but uh, but that won't it won't take an act of Congress. It'll just take an act by this commission because they've already been authorized to make this change. But in the Federal Register, uh, it was of note that they said they're going to, if they issue the rule that they're going to give the saw manufacturers 36 months to implement it. Um, so in the you know in the case where they were to do it, that you're looking at three years. So even if they were to adopt it sometime this year, which is an election year, and that's always gonna complicate things, and kind of the best case scenario wouldn't actually go into practice for three more years. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so do you think that um, if, if and when, and, and or when they implement this rule, do you think it's going to actually raise the prices of all table saws across the board from budget all the way up? I don't see how that it wouldn't. I mean, to me, it's simply requiring additional manufacturing costs to the saw. So I think it's almost inevitable that it would raise uh, the cost of the saw. I think one of the things that you'll have with a technology like this is that it'll be a race to the bottom as soon as the, the rule is passed. And initially, you'll see a cost increase, but that cost will come down over time as, as, as saw manufacturers get more competitive. One of the things that I'm concerned here with them adopting the rule, however, 
is, and this was also raised by the commission, is they really need to get uh, an agreement in place for what would be called a standard essentials patents package. So basically, any patents that would have to be uh, infringed or licensed in order to use this technology, they'd need to get permission from the companies that own those patents to do so. Because if they don't, you basically, you would have a scenario where you have saw manufacturers that might not be able to manufacture saws at all. So I really think before they were to adopt this rule that they really need to make sure that there's a path forward for any saw manufacturer to to get a reasonable license fee uh, from one of the patent donors. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I guess that leads into the next question. Do you think it's fair to force table saw manufacturers uh, and possibly give a monopoly to that patent holder for this rule? I mean, is this is this fair for everybody or is it just more about public safety? So in, in my opinion, it's just an area that that uh, this technology isn't that familiar with. Uh, it's just not that common a practice when it comes to tools. In my practice uh, of, of law, I do a lot uh, of telecommunications work. And so anybody that's seen 4G, 5G, uh, and whatever on your cell phone, all of those have standard essentials patents, and they do kind of what I was uh, uh, talking about earlier. They'll have a big bundle of patents that all have to be used in order to meet the throughput of a 5G network, for instance, and you have to pay a license. So it's very common in a lot of uh, technologies where there's a lot of interoperability between different systems. And it's so common in the computer world because everything from, you know, USB to graphics adapters have have a lot of standards uh, that that require not just that they're safe, of course, but that they that they can work interwork with other companies. It's just not as common in the tool business. Um, quite frankly, I sometimes wish it would be. Wouldn't it be great if we all had a standard battery pack so that we Maybe didn't all. have to, you know, use different batteries for different manufacturers? But you know, in this case, this would be this would be the type of thing that that they would have a standard for, and you'd have to license it from, you know some companies. Is that fair? In my opinion, it is because it's so common with other industries um, and, and it has worked well there. So I don't know why it per se wouldn't work because uh, I actually think the licensing costs are going to be relatively small compared to the manufacturing costs of adding the safety equipment. Michael, you said before, uh, right before we got on the call, that there was another angle on this that nobody's talked about, health insurance. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, so one of the things uh, in our first call, you know, I, I was looking at some of the comments um, from, uh, the, the, from the first video, and, and one of the things that was brought up a lot is lawsuits. And, and people said, why would somebody sue over, you know, cutting their finger off? It just seems, you know, fair, or whatever. I mean, finding out that a saw can cut your finger off is like finding out that professional wrestling is scripted, right? Um, but uh, I would say that a lot of people don't always realize that a lot of the lawsuits are brought on behalf of your insurance company. If anybody has been in a car accident and had to go to the hospital, about five minutes after you get out of the hospital, you get a letter from your insurance company asking for the subrogation rights, basically their right to sue on your behalf. And so a lot of the lawsuits that deal with product safety are actually the medical companies, the medical insurance that are bringing the lawsuits on the behalf of the people that were injured by them. It's not necessarily the people themselves. The, the case will reflect the same because that's how the law works. But, it, but if you actually looked at who they were hiring the attorneys and that sort of things, it's the medical insurance companies. And at wow. this point, their, their interests are in uh, lowering the cost of insurance. And if people are needing medical care for this, they're going to be motivated through lobbying groups and whatever to try to push this through. It's also going to be a, a bigger issue for like workman's compensation because of all the loss of work claims that happen uh, because of this. It's sort of like the hidden the, the hidden parties that aren't really at the table because they're not going to want to advertise they are, but a lot of the back channel money will be coming from uh, insurance companies. Gosh. It's crazy, man. I, I just find this so interesting. It just, it's just, I, I've spent hours and hours reading and watching these videos on this new stuff. I, I had no idea it happened in October. I would have already jumped on this, but it was, uh, it's so interesting. Do you have anything else you would like to add on this topic? The only thing that else that I have to add is that uh, it looks to me like there are 
um, enough ways to design around the case, at least most of the, the, the patents uh, that are that have expired that are not expired from uh, saw stop rather. Uh, if you go with some of the technology, the uh, register noted that there is um, a technology by the Fiedler Group where they actually use capacitive coupling, but it, they detect the capacitive flow before your hand touches the blade. And that would, as far as I know, the saw stop patents, and I haven't looked through all of them, but they usually require contact with the blade before it would drop beneath the table. Um, so, you know, there, there, there have been some uh, mechanisms that possibly wouldn't infringe. The biggest problem going forward was just that you're going to have to have some way that the, the saw manufacturers can make the saws affordable without creating a monopoly. And quite frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if that's ultimately what, why this is not adopted for at least a few more years until they get to a point where all of the pat all the original patents have expired and one of the weird things in patent law that I that I actually don't agree with at all is that you can't manufacture a infringing device in the United States like you you can't make use or sell an infringing device but what that what that has the unintended consequence of is you could make them offshore and then wait until the patent expires and then the day after import them. So it sort of discourages U.S. Uh, uh, you know, U.S. manufacturing in that case. And so it has sort of a, you know, again, an un unintended consequence there. So waiting the 36 months, at the end of the 36 months, a lot of these patents will have expired by then anyway. So that might be when what they, they ultimately decide to do there uh, and, and have them start to be imported on the day, you know, or within months of the final expiration. And I thought there's a couple points there I thought of when you were talking. A Felder Group, I noticed they have a letter that they sent to the commission answering their questions that I talked about earlier in the video. In their response, they're like, if we, our, our costs are thousands of dollars. I don't remember what it was, like eight to $11,000 it adds to on their saw, something similar to that. And they said that they don't see any way that it's gonna lower it much more than $1,000. And then also Bosch made some type of confidential agreement with SawStop not to sell their saws or their use their technology. So their technology is out. So it really only leaves until the patents run out. SawStop is the only ones with this technology unless somebody else puts in the time, effort, and money to design something totally new. I, mean, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on this. I, half of me thinks it's, it's kind of, you know, they've run their course. They <laughs> give it up, man. It's time to let everybody have it. And then they're laughing, it's like, well, I mean, they are business, they have a right to make money. So I, I have very mixed feelings on it. One of the things I will say, as, as far as opinion goes, I did feel it a little disingenuous by Stephen Gass to make the statement that he's, you know, he's not involved in the patent ownership anymore, but he's still trying to look out for safety. I'm like, yeah, now that you've made a king's ransom on your invention, now you're concerned with, uh, you know, the, the public health, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I do think that when you make statements like that, you know, it doesn't always look the best after after you've managed to protect your own idea for 20 years. If you wanted to give it away a long time ago, you could have, but yeah. you know, you didn't. So it's going to be interesting, man. I I think this is just it's fascinating to me. I don't know why, but it just is. Well, you know, the the ultimately, I think the the. The, the final rule here is I think that by requiring this in some way, shape, or form, and if they can do it cost effectively, it will increase the number of people that go into the hobby because I cannot tell you when I was first, you know, as an adult and I had graduated law school and I said I was going to start woodworking, oh, you can cut your finger off. <laughs> you know, it's like it's, it's almost a reflexive answer that people have when you, when you talk about it. So teenagers that you're scared of using these type of this type of equipment you know if you know right at the get go that you know a teenager that takes their eye off the the ball for a second that they'll still be safe i just think that it'll it'll help increase the uh uh the use in the hobby so so in the net the net benefit i think will be good i agree and you, you get some comments when they talk about well, any video i've done on soft stop or any safety technology like that they they say well you're they're just you're just complacent but I can tell you from experience, personally, I still respect that blade because I don't, oh, I don't mean it's probably going to work, but do I trust it 110%? I don't want that blade touching my finger. <laughs> so I don't think it introduces too much complacency there. No, no, I, 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 I agree. I, I, 
I did think it was interesting that when you bring that up that so in 2010 they started requiring the upper blade guard on uh, a you know, module on the saw. But I would tell you unequivocally if you look on YouTube and watch woodworking videos like I do, I'd say less than 10% of the time somebody's actually using that upper sa blade guard. Now, I try to use mine when I can, but there's so many times like if you're using a sled it just doesn't fit on. Right. So there's, you know, there's that issue. Um, there's another issue that I didn't think the commission talked about at all was they want to set the standard for um, the, you know, the maximum depth of cut to be 3.5 millimeters, which is about one eighth of an inch. Um, now, the one thing I can say that I've seen safely done with table saws is you typically only raise the blade about a eighth of an inch above the workpiece that you're doing. I think a lot of the injuries that are happening, at least from people I've talked to and, and seen, is actually not from when you're pushing the wood through the blade, but when people leave the blade on and they're grabbing the next piece, so they reach over yep. the saw and then they put their hand on the top of it. And I don't know that they're going to meet that standard because even the saw stop one, there's a question of if they can, you know, you're only looking at stitches, which is, you know, doesn't get into bone, but right. it doesn't quite meet that 3.5 millimeters uh, standard when you reach from the top. If it's yeah. And you get, if you look at Blacktail Studio has an excellent slow-mo video on this. Like when you th throw your hand down, like say if you tripped or fell over, like you get much more damage than if you're just pushing at a normal pace. So I guess it depends on... Uh, the force that your hand touches the blade. Like I, don't, I, I, I thought that too when I saw that uh, rule. I was like, how does that work across the board? Like it's hard to, to establish. I know they have to establish some type of measure, but that's going to be difficult, I think. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Michael. Man, I thank you so much again for helping us. Let it, uh, if they need to get in contact with you about a patent or patent questions, uh, is there a way they can contact you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I still have the uh, email address set up for this. It's wood at Taroli.com. That's uh, T-A-R-O-L-L-I.com. You can uh, reach me there. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Thank you. If this topic intrigues you as much as it does me, you got to check out that video right there. Real Lawyer Reacts to Saw Stop Patent Myths because there's a lot of myths about it. Click that box, get you the big old virtual fist bump. Thank you for watching.